Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. I heard about this company and this founder because I actually got a package delivered to me. Um, I interviewed the founder of Simple Squares, and I got the package. I'm like, this is this is good. I like this. And I looked, oh, it's shipped from ShipBob. So today we have Divi Galati, he's co-founder of ShipBob, and they, he started it with his partner, Drew Saxena. ShipBob provides automation and on-demand shipping and packaging for small businesses. They shipped out over 500,000 packages to date and growing fast. That's why he's in this office because I think he got kicked out of his office because they need the <laughs> space. Uh, they've raised over $5 million to date and serve businesses in Chicago, New York, and L.A. Divi, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So we talked about growing fast. Growing, You've been growing too fast. So what does that look like right now? What, what happens uh, with the company because it's growing so fast. So growing fast is a fun challenge in itself. Yeah. So growing fast, well, one easy thing to measure is the space you utilize. So we started in Drew's apartment in Chicago, and that was 800 square feet apartment. We started out the living room. Within three months, we ran out of that space. So what were you doing in the living room? Take me back to the living room days. Oh, good old days. So. Yeah. We were everything, so it was a team of four people essentially working our butt off in getting sales, developing the product at the same time, and we were part of Y Combinator, so right. with their guidance, we were able to achieve a lot more. So was this so, in San Francisco? No, so we actually launched in Chicago. Oh, you so did? we're one of the few companies, even though we were part of YC, we launched our company in Chicago because of our network. Yeah. And because of the cost associated with launching a yeah. startup, with, which has some physical presence as well. So, so when, you, when you were in the living room, were you devel- doing a lot of development or did you have actual inventory scattered across the living room? So we did do packaging out of the living room. Really? So we had okay. boxes, peanuts, uh, <laughs> bubble wrap and everything all over the place and wasn't the ideal set up right. obviously and we destroyed the carpet and the tables and the couch whatever was there well we didn't intentionally destroy it but you know when tapes all over the place things right. do tend to get a little sticky in the end so right. that was the start and then we moved into a 1200 square feet where like office space yeah and then we started our team we expanded our team and we hired a few warehouse staff there and then Soon enough, within six months, we ran out of room there. So we acquired two offices next door. Yeah. And then... So you just expanded it. So you kept the 1,200 and you expanded yeah. two more offices. Exactly. So because we kept adding services to our business. So with adding services, we got more and more clients and we're growing fast. And our growth typically has been close to like 20, 25% month yeah. over month. Yeah. So like every four months we're doubling ourselves. So obviously we're out of room. And then within a year, we ran out of those three office spaces. So we moved wow. out, got uh, 8,500 square feet warehouse wow. in Chicago. And a year later, we are live in Chicago, New York, LA, and now we are out of space in Chicago warehouse, which was 8,500 square feet. So what are you yeah. going to do? Well, uh, I gave up my room and the conference room to the warehouse. That's where you see the boxes yeah. behind me. And now we're actually moving into a much bigger warehouse and separating warehouse and offices completely. How do you know when to act, it's too painful to actually move? Because it's, it's a big undertaking, right? You have to move everything yeah. over to this new space. So at what point do you decide we... You know, we can't just push it into another office. We need to get a whole new facility. Well, uh, we learned from our mistakes. The first time we ran out of room, we could see things piling up. There were like 
two people working on the same table. Yeah. Like no one had any private space. We actually took the calls outside of our office back in the day. So which is still happening. But now we know we are out of space because we cannot add any more inventory in Chicago or add new clients in Chicago. Yeah. We're diverting clients to other two cities. And that has becoming that is becoming an innovating factor for the Chicago GM now because he wants to grow his team and his own department and that's why we know we have to move out and if you would have been here we're very close to like actually getting in trouble with OSHA right now because things are just getting stacked higher and higher dead capacity yep yeah we'll have to come by since we're both in Chicago um let's talk about the services for a second you know, Debbie, because you mentioned at a certain point you added services. So what, what service did you start off with when you were in 800 and then 1200? And then I want to talk about, because you have the local pickup, the warehousing, the batch fulfillment. So what, did it, what service did you start off with offering? Yeah, definitely. So it might be better if I give you an idea why we started service in the yeah. first place. So me and Drew, we were actually running an e-commerce store ourselves, which was more of a custom e-commerce store for photo printing and shipping. Yeah. So every time we would get an order, we would go stand in line at the Sears, Sears Towers post office. And when we started talking to people, it turns out they were small business owners just like us, but they hadn't figured out a solution. And being engineers ourselves, we automated every single step of the process except the shipping, which was still manual. Yeah. So, we, so what did that look like? Someone would take a picture in their phone, and then what would happen? So initially, we launched with an app for businesses in which you could actually link your eBay store directly or your Shopify store directly, or you can create a manual order, take a picture, and someone will swing by, pick up your items, and get them back to the warehouse wheel package and ship. Mm-hmm. But soon we realized that businesses, we're dealing with businesses here, so... Businesses usually stay at one place. They are in their offices or right. their retail storefronts all day long. So right. they don't need on-demand shipping. What they need is scheduled daily pickups. So we pivoted very little bit and we started offering daily pickups and scheduled. So every day we would go to the same stores at a fixed time. So it brings efficiencies to our logistics and pickups. Right. And then it gives predictability to the small business owners and retailers as well. So that was the first service we started with, essentially. That was the local the pickup. Pick- yep. Yeah. And then... And I, I think I read that you use Uber. Yeah, so way back, like in the first two months, because we didn't have resources to do our own background checks and to vet people ourselves, right. we would just get Uber drivers going. Why not? Around. Yeah. Yeah. They're background verified. They're cheap. They're easy to find. So that's how we started. And then eventually, again, because we were moving into more scheduled piece, we wanted more control over these drivers. So we limited the number of drivers and had fixed routes for them. And that's how, you know, we got economies of scale and pickup itself. Right. And then as we started scaling up, we realized some of the businesses were giving us the same items on a daily basis. So... I still remember this person was selling tea and every day he'll get like 10, 15 orders and we'll go and pick the exact same tea. Right. So just as a pilot, we actually held this tea in bulk for a week to see how fast can we turn around and fulfill his orders. And it worked magically for both of us. So we right. developed system across actually warehousing. So now yeah. we actually warehouse inventory for our clients. Yeah. And because of that, we can reach clients across the world. So right now, we have clients from Australia, Finland, uh, Southeast Asia using us and storing their inventory with us in our warehouses. Really? How do they hear about you, like an Australian company? Like, like take for example. Yeah. yeah. So if you Google best fulfillment company for small business, our name will pop up. Mm-hmm. It's mostly because of our some SEO efforts, but... Otherwise, word of mouth has been very powerful for us. Right. The other day, we were mentioned in some Middle Eastern blog and a Korean blog. Really? And we don't even know how to like translate that properly, but they've mentioned our name in those blogs right. because someone used us and the word of mouth spread. Yeah. So small businesses, they're very well knit, and we're targeting mm. certain niches of these small businesses, certain industry verticals. 
and that way it's very able to gather steam much faster. Yeah. And Divi, this seems like it's not a simple process. So what's the, what's the learning curve with then setting up a warehousing facility? Okay, so setting up a warehousing facility, it is slightly more complicated than like a software, just to build right. a software. Cause you have to handle physical piece as well. Yeah. But luckily, we have a team who has some background relevant experience yeah. in this field. So the process has been fairly smooth for us because we've got the right hires at the right point of time. But setting up warehouses is essentially getting the right space and having the vision of what's coming next and prepare yourself in advance. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've been able to match our sales and the operation side very well so far. Yeah. So I could see how you have the local pickup and then it just made sense to, to put the warehousing piece because like we're doing the same pickup over and over, just warehouse you know, just have us, you know, have it in, in house and we'll ship it off. What what's the what about the batch fulfillment? Talk about that. So batch fulfillment. So if you know about Kickstarters, Indiegogo and all these crowdfunding campaigns right, right. that are ge- getting steam now. Yeah. And that's because it's much easier to reach to these people and Kickstarter has standardized a way where people can launch their product right. with just an idea. So we initially came across a couple of great graphic novel artists who reached out to us that they wanted to use our services right. because they had decent success on Kickstarter. So we started with them and they are actually a very good target market for us because they give us a lot of shipments at once. And that is what batch fulfillment is all about. If you come up with the idea and you're doing pre-sales, yeah. you can still use us. And once your pre-sales are over, you can continue using our services, our warehousing service, to carry on with your sales. And you don't even have to focus on fulfillment. We'll take care of the entire process. So it looks like, I'm just I'm looking over here because I have a screen of the batch fulfillment. So it looks like, let's say someone has a thousand pre-sales. They can send all of the inventory to you. Yep. And... Basically, there's a, a fee for the receiving, and then there's just a fee for them to send out all the to all the customers. Essentially, yeah, exactly. So, typically, back in the day, like these companies, three PL, third party logistics company, started in early 2000s or 1980s or yeah. somewhere around there, and they were catering to these Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. So yeah. they demanded volume, right. and they build like these custom software, custom integrations every single time they onboarded a new client. And these are still stuck in like early 2000s. Right. And then the companies like Shopify, Kickstarter, Etsy, they came along and changed how people reached their customers online. They've right. made it much easier to sell online. But these three PLs haven't adapted and thus they do, the small businesses do not have the logistic support sure. as the big companies have. And that's why a company like ShipUp exists now because these platforms have made it much easier to sell and now they're gaining a lot of traction. Yeah. So we're behind these software companies and providing software support for after they make their first sale. Right. So Divi, what are people using ShipBob for that you wouldn't have expected? So, well, the width of product that we see is amazing. So yeah. initially we thought, okay, we'll do local pickups for retailers and just warehousing for local clients. But what we've seen in the past is people have used us to introduce their product into the U.S. market altogether, hmm. which has been a very exciting yeah. journey for yeah. us. What's an example of that that you could talk so, about? So Ambronite, uh, it's a Soylent competitor from Finland. So they're like super drinkable, super meal. Huh. What's it called? Ambronite. Ambronite. A-M-B-R-O-N-I-T-E. Okay. So they essentially introduced their product in the U.S. and we became their shipping partner right away. Wow. And we hold their inventory for every single order that comes in for U.S. and Canada. Wow. Yeah, I can so, see how you, you have to grow so quickly. If you get one of these big companies, it's like that's a lot of space. Exactly. And it's not just about the space. It's about the orders. And we're not just helping them fulfill their orders on the shipping side. We're helping them with their order management because we allow these sellers of these small businesses to sell across multiple channels and they can view all their orders in one place, they can view all their inventory in one place and then we even communicate with their end consumer customers what the tracking number is, what's the ETA of the package being delivered. 
and so we bring them the value yeah. of of entire solution yeah. and now we're not going to stop there because we have their inventory we have our ship captains who go do these pickups and if you connect the dots it's very easy for us to compete with amazon or complement amazon fulfillment and provide same day delivery services right. for these small businesses which was unheard of for anyone who's not selling on amazon yeah. so now these small businesses have the power of building their own brand while still promising the two day amazon prime fulfillment or same day fulfillment right. without using amazon's ful- fulfillment yeah. services why do you find people not wanting to use that and use their own service? Okay, as let's say you own a small business and you're creating a new product, you want to create your own brand. Yeah. But if you go on Amazon, Amazon is more of a commoditized experience. It's a commoditized shopping experience. Right. So people are looking for the same product at the lowest cost possible. Yeah. And then you don't own the entire behavior of the consumer you don't get the insights you don't even get the consumer list if you're on Amazon Prime Amazon handles everything for you so essentially you have the product and then you but you don't have any control over the brand yeah that's why people are moving away from Amazon they're selling on Amazon to gather the first sale but then they're directing their customers to their own Shopify or their own Magento their right. own big commerce stores and that's why Shopify grew so fast, 50% year over year, and became public because small businesses want their own online yeah. presence, their yeah. own brand. And that's why companies like us exist now as well. Yeah. Yeah. What are some innovative things, Divi, that people are including in the box? Is, is there any like innovative, like, like uh, I guess I'm thinking, to get people back to purchase or, or drive people back to their site? So there are multiple like marketing collateral that they include yeah. right now. So a lot of people include their thank you cards, their PR. So you've got simple square boxes. So they actually yeah. include their PR sometimes in there. Right. And then people include like freebies. They'll randomly throw in a gift with a coupon that'll make you buy, make another purchase essentially. So those things, typical fulfillment center will never be able to attain or provide these services yeah. to small businesses because they're still in 2000s but our software which we built internally is so flexible that you can actually run these promotions ad hoc without even telling us and somehow our software will catch it in our system the operation system will fulfill those orders in that specific way yeah, yeah. and so bill nye the science guy was a customer <laughs> Yes, he is still a customer and one of the best, coolest customers because we got a handwritten note from him. What did you do for him? So Bill and I, the science guy, had the biggest Kickstarter for a documentary film in the history. So Bill and I, the science guy documentary, is coming out this year yeah. and they were raising money on Kickstarter last year. <clears throat> so we handled all their shipping for the merchandise. So. If you donated, let's say, $50, you got, you got to order a t-shirt, a mug, tattoos, frisbee, whatever. So there were 16,000 backers, and it was a two-person team leading this Kickstarter, and we took care of all their logistics. So mm-hmm. they sent all their inventory from their manufacturers. We did the rest for them. Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. Who are some other interesting customers? So we have some very, very interesting customers I heard Quinoa out of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Another great health food company. They're, they've been our customer for a long time now. Then there's No Meat Athlete since... No Meat you know, Athlete? Yeah. What so do they sell? They have merchandise, so t-shirts, stickers, etc. But they're promoting vegetarianism or veganism, sort of. Okay. And for athletes. So that's pretty cool. Then we have... Hanging with the homies, there's like an air freshener company from Australia that okay. we store products for. So pretty interesting there. And sorry, I'm just looking up and I'm yeah. seeing these products, which are the coolest products I've ever seen. And then we have a bunch of apparel companies. Glow Recipe, they actually get the best Korean beauty products from Korea mm. and sell in the US. I've heard of that, yeah. Hmm. So... so- what um who's not a fit to you ship bob so not a fit 
oh, let's say Apple comes to us tomorrow, that's <laughs> definitely not a fit, right fit for us because they have their own. You'll figure problems. that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for Apple, right. I guess we'll have to, but that won't be a right fit for us because yeah. they're more of a traditional, the requirements are more traditional. They're not built on, let's say, Shopify or e commerce. So mm-hmm. the best fit for us is a business, small to mid sized business, mm-hmm. who's selling on his own website, yeah. eBay, their Magento mm-hmm. store, and Etsy. The more platforms they're selling on, the better it is for us because yeah. we have the capabilities. Or they have to have e commerce presence. Yeah. yeah. A retail storefront who has no e commerce presence is probably not a good fit for us at yeah. all. Yeah. You know, you know, can you talk about the tech? I mean, this is not just as a physical product, but you have a huge technology platform, you know, yep. the, behind all of this. So talk exactly. about the technology journey. You know, you know be, was it before Y Combinator that you started, you know, coming yeah. up with it, or was it during Y Combinator? So our so me and Drew both co-founders are engineers ourselves. Yeah. So we started with the tech yeah. first because yeah. we knew logistics problem can be solved, but tech yeah. is yeah. what will back our whole logistics yeah. chain. What we are creating. Yeah. And so you guys the, met in college. No, so I have known Drew for twenty eight years now. Really? So how I grew up with him. How did, so, how did you meet? So our parents are parents work together essentially really so that's why we knew each other and we were born like a few miles from each other and we've been in touch since so we grew up in india t- together and then we both came to us together but just really different universities so at what point did you move to the u.s was it for college yeah so we came here for college for our undergrad and then he did his master's in engineering as well i did my mba and we both ended up in chicago and wow. so it was like a match made in heaven almost because we knew each other's strengths and it was so easy for us to oh start gosh. working together. That is crazy. So did we talk about growing up in India? What was that like? It was very different from where we are now. The yeah. opportunities were less. Competition was insane, I would say, because we were competing for those top 100 engineering colleges and everyone was applying for the same. So. That competition taught us a lot, but the values, the Indian culture values are still with us, and that's why the culture of the company is very respectful to each other. And that's why I think our roots are good for us, that we came from India and we did not have those many opportunities, so we do appreciate the opportunities here, and we like humble people to join our company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was a big culture shock when you came here? What was the biggest was, difference that you found coming from growing up in India and then coming to the U.S.? It's just the open-mindedness of the people here was pretty amazing. In India, like everyone tends to follow the same path. You either become a doctor, you either become an engineer, you become a CPA, and practically those are the three options. Otherwise, you're not good enough. But here, a lot of pressure from the family. You mean? To do yeah, those there's things? a lot of pressure on the family, but it's yeah. more of a social norm. Mm. So it's a joke that in India, people usually become engineers and then they figure out what they want to do with their lives. And that is true. And that's why like, most, India produces the most number of engineers. But that thing, like, that's a stereotype and that is now finally changing with this generation. But that was like the norm for the middle class families but once we came here people were so open so for example like in India you'll never see a religious study class and I just took one for my social curriculum requirement but that sparked my interest in religious studies as well and I took a few classes and almost did a minor there so people do experiment with other things here and that was not a culture shock but that that's big difference amazed us yeah. that people are open and they're trying different things yeah. and learning along the way. So what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were young? So when I was young, I somehow I always wanted to be a computer engineer. I was one you of did? The pack- yeah, so I forgot I- to mention a fun fact about you that most people don't know is that you are ranked in the top 2,000 FIFA online or FIFA game players of out of over 8 million. Yeah. So were so, you playing video games growing up? 
no, I was not allowed to. Maybe that's why I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> so video game is my part-time passion, but throughout my life, computer engineering was my passion, and I started coding when I was like eight years old or really? so. Really? So that helped. So you and Drew teamed up, and so what did the first part of the technology look like early on? So the first part of technology was just building the back end, which was the most boring stuff. But we'll remember what Y Combinator taught us all along. So yeah. we were trying to build this fancy looking mobile app so people can, you know, push orders with the click of a button, they can have everything streamlined on a mobile. And it takes time because if you want to make something pretty, it takes a long time. But YC, our partners, they pushed us. They're like, don't worry about getting the app done yet. Get the customers first. And they, forced us almost to put a simple web form online to accept orders. So that was mm -hmm. the first technology thing to create, like accept orders, which we created a simple web form. What's your name? What's your pickup address? What are you shipping? And yeah. where are you shipping? Yeah. That's it. And that was the first technology we finally built and perfected and started accepting orders online. And then we developed that so one form into a dashboard, which is now... For most businesses, we have over a thousand businesses using us on a, almost on a daily basis. Yeah, that is their place, their go-to place on a daily yeah. basis for what orders they've got, how much inventory they've got, what complaints they're having if the order is not delivered, where is it stuck yeah. in the process, and then how are they doing in terms of sales? Everything, all the answers about their sales and their shipping is in one central location. And soon we'll actually provide them more tools to better predict their sales and their inventory churn yeah, as well. Yeah. And Tiffy, I want to continue on the technology journey. And I, I want to go, I'm going to go back to the customer journey and how you got your first customers. Because you have some interesting stories about how you picked up your first customers. What was it like um, getting into Y Combinator? Because that's also a rigorous process. Yeah. So their interviews are difficult and you actually need to have some traction before yeah. you get into YC when you apply to YC and as I told you the story that we were in the post office line while using our own e-commerce platform of the past and selling things online and shipping in the post office and we started talking to people and realized this pain point and when we realized the pain point we knew it was big because everyone was facing the same issue we did not stop there. We decided to solve, and we built a very simple prototype and started taking emails of people right there. And in certain cases, sometimes to even get their emails, we'll actually stand in line instead of them in the post office to ship out their packages. Really? Yeah, that's how we actually got some traction. We had some interest even before we launched, and when we applied to YC, that was the idea. We'll simplify the shipping for small businesses. Yeah with one piece at a time. And then once we got through Y Combinator to get our first set of customers again, we went to post office, stood in front of the post office and pitched to people walking in to use ShipBob and give us the package instead of going standing in line themselves. You're poaching their customers. So what was your pitch? What would you say to them? So, well, they would park their cars and by the time they'll walk... This was in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago throughout. Because if and, someone came up to me, I'm walking in the post office, I'm like, I'm, I don't want to give you my package. How did you exactly. convince them to, what was your pitch? Yeah. Well, we never gave up. So we would pitch them the idea and we would be like, hey, we are a startup. We totally understand you won't trust us, but just listen to our pitch that we are trying to change this broken process. We're trying to change the world right here in mm -hmm. front of the post office. And surprisingly, a lot of people showed support. They give us their packages, even though they were like one-off customers, they'll be like, okay, take my package, hope you learn something from this, and we'll actually get their credit card on the spot too really? to charge them. So, How do you charge them? Just with like a, a reader, like a square no, or something? We would make them download the app and put their credit card. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. So people were very receptive, which was surprising for us, but we actually got our first 100 customers in front of post Just office. Just knocking, on, not even knocking on doors, but standing outside your competitor. That yeah, was... well, not competitor, partner now. Partner. What was your setup? Like, did you have a table? Did you have, like, a shirt so people would trust you? I mean, because you have to build trust very quickly in that situation. So we had shirts and ship captain hats, okay. a mobile phone and an iPad in our hand. 
but we were not allowed to set up table because of the postal police. And eventually, we were kicked out of <laughs> post offices, and we were not allowed within hundred yards. So, so, so they give you, they download the app, they pay for it, they give you the package, and then you just wait in line in the post office and deliver it. What's, uh, what's the next step? What would you do? Yeah, so either we'll do that, or we'll actually price shop across carriers. Mm. So that's the software which we built as well. That we are able to price shop across USPS, UPS, FedEx on our own accounts and get the best rates possible for our customers. Yeah. And we would actually price shop and would tell them that, hey, post office is probably a little too expensive for this shipment and it might not get there the next day. So you would use FedEx instead and we would provide that service for free and just charge them for the shipping, which they would have paid anyways. Yeah, wow. Who are some of the influential mentors at Y Combinator and then some of the advice they gave you? Yeah, so Kevin, Hale, and Kasser. They are partners at Y Combinator. They were working closely with us throughout our journey, and they were definitely super influential. And they actually went to a point in which there was a personal relationship because obviously they wanted to see us succeed. Once Cusser even called us randomly on a Saturday afternoon and told us that our website looked horrible <laughs> and told us to go right away to the closest Starbucks and ask people, what they understand what we do just by looking at our website for 30 seconds. Right. And give them five bucks for every person we actually spoke to that day. And that simple suggestion, but more on a personal level, yeah. helped us refine our messaging early on. What did people tell you when you went up to them in Starbucks? They could not understand what we did because our website was more technical. Okay, we'll do this, 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 but they did not get why yeah. it benefits them. Yeah. So you had to switch our messaging around yeah. on the front page as well. Yeah. So now it's top-notch packaging plus simple, affordable pricing? Is yeah, that exactly. That's what we do. Yeah. So what else is unique with the technology? So talk about developing the technology through – because you start with the simple web form – how did it progress from there? So Simple Web Form was a stopgap solution to take orders before we had any right. more technology ready. Right. And once we got that, we started listening to our customers. Again, a great YC advice. Every day we would like actually chat online with our customers, ping them, hey, what are your pain points now? We started developing dashboard by dashboard. So after the web form, we built integration. So we built integration with eBay, Shopify, Magento, BigCommerce, Etsy, whatever you, wherever you can sell your items on. Yeah. So we can pull in the orders automatically. So people don't have to manually push their orders themselves. So that was a good start for us to actually fetch all the orders and get some repeat usage out of our software. <clears throat> and once we had that covered, the next step was making sure their inventory, if they're storing themselves or storing with us, always matches up. So they're in, not running low on stock. Yeah. Yeah. So then we developed that piece. And on the in the parallel, we were developing our internal tools as well. So those things we kept working on. And I come from like a consulting background and I was doing logistics consulting with a big consulting firm. Right. So I knew where these big softwares failed because they're so clunky and they cannot yeah. provide you with the right data yeah. at the right time. Well, yeah, what was failing with those that you knew you had to change? So the bigger software, like bigger inventory management software, traditional softwares, essentially are so big and heavy, you cannot get real-time reports. You have to like batch the reports. You'll get a report after like six hours, and then you have to... The setup itself takes a long time. Yeah. So let's say you want to implement an Oracle inventory system. Good luck. It's going to take you six months to implement it. But that's something small business cannot afford in terms yeah. of all resources for sure so what we did was we made this implementation so simple if you are ready to ship today you can start using ship Bob today itself it takes less than 30 seconds to integrate all your stores get everything in line really and that's what we've done and that's where the most technology efforts went to make sure everything is streamlined and it's fast and well suited for well the 21st century so how do you you know, there's probably just a numerous amount of integrations that you can make. You know, you can go on and on, right? How do you decide what's next and what to integrate with next? So listening to customers is the yeah. key here. So we also have like a chat feature in our website where we can see what people are coming in and we talk to them. Hey, 
do you think we're missing an integration? I see. What? And then we'll try to like get some data before we make any decision. Because we're engineers and we like data, we like math. Right. So we like to see numbers and prove ourselves that this is the right step to go forward. Right. So what have you decided, because that's also a tough position. Let's say a customer comes and goes, I want to use you, but I need you to integrate with X company, right? Yeah. And maybe that's not on your list. At what point, what, what was a tough decision that you decided not to integrate because you just had other stuff you were focusing in on? So, for example, Yahoo stores. Uh, this was like a very old Yahoo uh, platform that Yahoo built. Right. And some people were, are still using it. But we had to make a very tough decision there if we want to integrate with the Yahoo stores, which some people are using right now. Maybe they'll use for another year. Maybe but they switch. But the trend is, yeah, they're switching because yeah. it's not more favorable. It's not that customizable. So small businesses are moving away. Yeah. So we could have captured some customers right away, but they would have churned away because they would move to another platform. So we decided to go the other route first, actually integrate with the modern platforms first to capture the early adopters, and then you can work backwards. Because anyways, everyone will move towards these platforms. Yeah. So what are some of the big mistakes? I mean, you see across a wide range of sellers. What are some of the big mistakes you see sellers making? Inventory. Like ordering more inventory than what they should. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of small businesses start up and they'll order, let's say, 100,000 units of product and they'll put so much resources in. It's a lot of product. While, yeah, without launching the product. So they don't know how their product will perform. You so. call them and tell them, stand outside the post office <coughs> and sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Not the post office, wherever. The grocery the store, yeah. Stores, yeah. And we've seen that over and over again. They'll order a lot of inventory and then yeah. six months down the line, if they're not doing well, we'll have to work with them to figure out what to do with the inventory. Because it's not moving that's most cost prohibitive for them to just store their inventory. Yeah. And that's why listening to customers and like iterating on the product becomes very important for these small businesses. Yeah. So from the customer standpoint, Debbie, you start off obviously in the post office, then outside the post office. What else has worked with getting customers to find out and, and use ship up? So word of mouth has worked a lot for us. And I'm saying that because as I mentioned, small businesses is are very well knit. They're very tied to each other because they're learning from each other. They have communities, they have meetups. And that's what has helped us grow so fast is they t are, if we satisfy one customer, they'll talk to their peers. We're in similar space. Yeah. And that is what happened. That's why we have a bunch of health food products in our warehouses because we started with one health food product. We did very well with them. They referred us to other health food products. Yeah. What else is unique? I mean, again, like there's a big infrastructure technology wise. What else is unique about, um, you know, ship Bob technology? Yeah. So technology, we're completely different from anything else on the market right now because the mission statement, what we have is different from other logistics company. Other logistics company just want to fulfill the orders in a certain point of time and they're built like they're based somewhere somewhere out of in Kentucky, Utah or somewhere in the middle of the country. So the land is cheap for them. We're going the other route. We want to be closer to our merchants and closer to our end consumers so we can get the product to them faster and cheaper. Yeah. So we're working solely for small businesses and giving them Amazon-like logistics at a fraction of a cost. And right. that's the goal of the company. Yeah. And that's why the technology becomes a very key part for us. Now we're live in three cities. In next month or so, a small business who is starting out or has 100, 200 orders a month can actually store inventory in three different locations and not pay an arm and a leg for that. Yeah. And if an order comes from San Francisco or in West Coast, we'll ship out of LA office. If order comes in East Coast, New York office will fulfill it. Fulfill it. And in Midwest, Chicago office will fulfill it. Yeah. See, so you're shipping and getting the items delivered in two days and not even paying for two day shipping. Yeah. You have a big vision for this company. Yes. Talk about the vision a bit. So, the vision is to democratize 
logistics for small businesses and empower them to sell better and fulfill better. So we started, so we have a hub in a spoke model. We build this solid technology foundation on modern stack yeah. so that we can add more services on top. We started with local pickup, what we discussed. We added warehousing. Now we're adding returns. Same day delivery would be the next thing. So since we are already in Chicago, we can deliver items in Chicago the same day, LA, New York, similar. Then we can help these businesses sell better and list better because we're collecting all this data across so many small businesses. Why not just give them the tool to sell better based on these data points what we've collected. Yeah. So ultimately we want to create an ecosystem for these small businesses uh, dashboard where they can come in list their products see how their products are performing how to make them better how to sell them better and also take care of the fulfillment at the same platform yeah to be you know with fast growth comes you know funding and financing yep can you talk about some of the funding milestones that you've hit yeah, so we actually raised our seed round in 2014 after the Y Combinator yeah. demo day. And we were lucky enough to get SV Angel, Ron Conway's fund, Joe Montana, the football player, and oh, really? a few other backers right away who have been excellent support so far. And then earlier this year, we also raised our Series A, which was led by Hyatt Park Venture Partners. Yeah. And strategically... We also had two investors, one out of Europe, NFQ, and one out of Asia, recruit, who will eventually help us expand on a global scale. So for the first round of funding, like through the White Commodore Demo Day, was there a certain goal that you wanted to hit in order for you to launch? Yeah, so back then we were tracking week over week growth, and our target was to launch and then for consecutive 10 weeks have close to 30, 35% week over week growth. And we were able to do that and that gave us validity of the idea that this idea can work on scale and that's why we were able to raise the money. Yeah, and so what made you decide to raise more money and was that process difficult or not? Once you did your last round that you did of, I think it, I read on TechCrunch it said $4 million. Was that difficult or because it takes you away from your normal day to day? Fundraising is definitely a necessary evil yeah. for a startup founder. It takes you away from the core business which you're building. And unfortunately, when we were raising, it was not the best time to raise money either. But we were very lucky that we found Hyde Park Venture Partners early yeah. enough who actually share the same vision about e-commerce as us. So it wasn't a painful process for us, and it was made very smooth by our investors overall. So once you get that, now you have this influx, what do you do? What do you use it for? It's about stepping on the pedal and grow faster. So we were anyways profitable as a company, and we were doing great. But with this cash inflow, what we try to do is to actually expand to other markets so that we can enable split inventory and have faster shipping speeds and focus on the tech to back everything up. Yeah. I mean, with also the investment, you probably get a lot of other great mentors and advice. What are some of the advice that you got from some of the investors that's been valuable? Yeah, so we recently closed around and... We got some great mentors like Ira Wise, who is also teaching a class in Chicago booth. He's that good. He's already teaching a bunch of people. He came in and then our other two major investors, yeah. which I spoke about from Europe and Asia, they've yeah. been helping us yeah. define our strategy even further, how to target these markets and set specific goals. Because earlier, our goals were on the higher level, but they've helped us actually refine goals for each team so that we are growing fast. Yeah. So I always ask um, about the software and tools. What software are people using that's so, that, you know, obviously you see a lot of different e-commerce sellers. What are people using that's work that other people should be using? Obviously, ShipBob, what else are people using um, platform-wise or software to run their business that's important? 
Uh, Shabab is a game changing software which everyone should use. <laughs> right. But uh, apart from being biased about the own software we've, which we built, we've seen a lot of traction on Shopify. Yeah. Shopify is a platform that is easy to plug and play, and people, like a lot of our customers, have moved for Shopify or from other platforms really? as well. Just because the ease of use and the flexibility it gives you. Yeah. So Shopify is definitely, if you're still. If the listeners or the viewers are still trying to figure out which platform to use, Shopify yeah. is a definitely a good start, which is plug and play. Yeah. Any other integration partners that you found valuable because customers have mentioned them? Yeah. Uh, customers, so integration partners, we can have integrations on different levels. So we can have integrations with our e commerce platforms, we can have integrations with accounting platforms, right. industry platforms, right. but they're good partners everywhere. We love our partners. There are so many startups out there making life easier. So I mentioned Shopify is good for e-commerce, and there is something for accounting. Bench, they have done a great job in making accounting simple. Yeah. And the other software, so on the CRM side, we use <coughs> CRM, Close.io. Really yeah. They're great, and they've actually visited our office as well. So these different tools are very helpful for a soft, for yeah. a company like us who's growing and you don't want to build everything yourself. Yeah, yeah. There'll be two last questions. First, let's point people where should they check out shipbob.com and Bob stands for bend over backwards. So how did you come up with the name? Yeah, so, well, there are two stories to it. I can give you both sides of the story. <laughs> okay. Bob exists. So Bob... Uh, stands for bending over backwards. Right. You know? That means we are bending over backwards for our customer yeah. shipping needs. I like it. That's one story which we love to tell people. And there's another story. You have an uncle in India and his name is Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh, okay. no. I wish that was the case. But the other story was we were looking at some other names like Ship Tiger, Ship Hawk, etc. We could not find it and we found Ship Bob. That was available. Or, that domain was available? Yeah, ShipBob was the only thing available for $2.50 a year. Wow, ShipBob was available. I'm so surprised. Yeah, so that was the reason we went You had to make it work. Yeah. And we created a persona who this Bob is. Bob is an average American person who's in middle class trying to help people, a small business owner probably. And that just became Bob. And with Ship, we just put a hat on the Bob and became Ship Captain Bob. (laughs) I love it. What's been... Last two questions, Divi. What's been the lowest moment, a hard time that you pushed through? Because startups, running a business, it's not easy. And then the proudest moment. Start with the what's been the lowest or hardest point in the journey so far? So definitely there are times when things are like going against you and you can't figure out how to manage everything. Right. And we've mostly had ups because we were lucky enough to have a great team here. But a low point was when we initially started fundraising. We were looking at different options, how to go about fundraising process, and the market collapsed. And then there were some companies in similar spaces that started shutting down earlier this year. That's scary. Yeah, and fortunately that did not impact us a lot, but that did impact the people around us and people were scared and there was skepticism in the air Mm. and that somehow shook our confidence a little bit as well we had our vision right but we were not sure if that was the right time to go out and raise money so that was sort of a low which we faced but then it was followed by an immediate high by finding the right partner who had the same vision and that's where Hyde Park came in how did you meet them so we knew Hyde Park Throughout, so back in the day, like when we were raising a seed round, we finished raising, but then we got an introduction because Drew used to work for one of their portfolio companies earlier. Oh, really? So we just got an introduction, started talking to them, just kept in touch, and when we started raising Series A, we had a few conversations early on, and they were interested. So the fundraising in that climate was was difficult, very stressful. Difficult. Yeah, but we did not talk to so many people, but everywhere we would go, they'll first put us in the wrong bucket, and our job was to just 
convince them that we don't fall in that bucket of like high burn companies who are just burning money without a vision yeah. and negative because you have customers and you had yeah. you had growth and yeah yeah we had customers we had growth and we had positive margins those are the three key ingredients for a startup to survive right. you just need to make money so proudest moment so far with the company the proud one of the proudest moments was the la launch la so, launch when was that so we recently launched like three weeks ago yeah we got the warehouse and like two years ago we had no idea if we'll even make through one year with the idea or one month and two years later we opened our third warehouse the biggest warehouse and having three addresses in that warehouse because right. they're just three huge buildings connected with each other yeah. was a very proud moment for me to stand there and look look at what we've achieved it is amazing yeah in in just a few years what's different between the markets chicago new york la do you find any big differences there are huge differences actually so the their support is everywhere we go but the difference is in the geography and the traffic and the demog demography so if you think about chicago it's more condensed and the traffic situation is bad but not that bad so that allows us to have a lot more pickup clients in chicago but if you go to la it's so spread out and the traffic problem is so bad it's hard for us to target the market with just one service or pickup yeah that's why warehousing piece in it's la big. is much more important for us got it and New York, on the other hand, the property rates are so expensive. We'll never be able to like be in this city. <laughs> we'll get a big space. just get an apartment and start off with the eight hundred square foot apartment. <laughs> it's probably more expensive than the warehouse in Chicago. Exactly. So, just handling these three different markets has taught a lot to us in handling different sets of challenges. Yeah. What should we leave people with, Divi? What's a big lesson? Entrepreneurship. So the, the biggest lesson is. Don't take no as an answer and get used to rejections because that's what we did standing in line at the standing in front of the post office. As you mentioned, you would not give your credit card to anyone, but still, right. not taking that no for an answer and taking that rejection with a pinch of salt and go to the next person with the same energy and try to convince them right. why we're changing the world and what's the vision yeah. in 30 seconds. That was a great challenge for us, but we made it through. We got great customers out of it who are still using us. So that would be one key takeaway for all yeah. the entrepreneurs out there. Right. Divi, congratulations with all the success with ShipBob. Everyone should check out ShipBob.com. Thanks, Divi. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. This was a really fun conversation. Great. Okay, take care.